So now we move in to from the early from early years to you know the ad adolescence and um, teenage years. Um, you know, obviously during that time, your body is going through a lot of changes. You're starting to feel things that you didn't feel before. There's hair growing in places that, you know, that wasn't there yesterday, but now it is. So there's just all of these changes happening in your body. Um, you know, how does that, do, I mean, first of all, do you remember that? And did you experience that? I remembered a lot of weird feelings uh, that I, I, I never really had a really strong health sex ed course that really taught me about uh, different levels of intimacy. Uh, I, I had a lot of challenges physically simply because I went through an intense growth spurt when I just turned 14, where I went from five foot 10 to six foot three in one year. And I just remember all the different sensory pains that I was having. All my sensory challenges were always hypersensitive. So while I was going through my, my dad teaching me how to shave for the first time. And honestly, that was at the same time I was learning how to tie my sh shoes for the first time due to my fine motor challenges. I just remember a lot of transitional changes from that growth spurt to finding my fine motor challenges to be a little bit less intimidating. Uh, to get involved with sports, which I, I did throughout high school. And um, the, those were some of the big challenges. And then the whole intimacy thing, because no one really kind of gave me that blueprint of like, oh, this is how you can talk to girls. This right. is how, you, like, there was no blueprint. There was no mm -hmm. instructional manual on, on how to go about those puberty years. So those were some of my biggest challenges by far. Wow. And what about you, Stephen? Do you remember and you know, being a teenage boy going through all of these, you know, physical changes and probably, um, you know, developing um, attraction, like, you know, towards, you know, towards girls and you didn't know how to express that? Like, what did that feel like for you? Do you remember? Do you remember that time? In my adolescence, certainly as my body changed and how I kind of had to relearn how my body worked and how my sensory system worked. Uh, we, we often talk about adolescence being gangly and clumsy. Um, and yeah, that, that was it. Uh, but eventually uh, I figured out how my body did work. Uh, insofar as dating, I wasn't really interested in dating. It was just a total mystery to me. Uh, I would see other people doing it in middle and high school, but it wasn't something I was really interested in until I got to, until I got to my, uh, into my undergraduate program at university. So people with autism obviously have these feelings too. I think, I think a lot of people who are kind of on the outer, you know, outside looking in, um, they, they, this is, I wondered, like, I, I always wonder, um, you know, the kids that I work with, are they gonna, you know, what, what's it gonna be like for them when they grow up and they, are they gonna get married? Are they gonna, you know, are they gonna have relationships? And obviously, um, you know, you, the work that you do with them is, is hopefully going to help them out with some of that later on in the future. Um, and I just, I want to know, like, how is it, how is it like for you when you had, when you started to feel those feelings, like, oh, I see, I see a pretty girl, or I really like this person, or do you even, did you even conceive that what it was to like somebody? Well, what was that like for you? Uh, returning back to uh, high school, yeah. um, actually, I do remember being attracted to one uh, flute player. <laughs> somehow, getting her phone number, maybe I called information, calling her up, asking her if she wanted to, uh, uh, if she wanted to go on a date. Uh, she didn't seem interested. So uh, in typical autistic fashion, I said, oh, okay, and hung up and then called again the next week. And uh, she still wasn't, she said she was still busy. Uh, and then it occurred to me, well, 
uh, before I hang up, let's see if we can, uh, we can make a time for the following week or sometime in the future. And that is when uh, she said that uh, she wasn't interested in dating and maybe we could, we could just be friends and that would be fine. Right. It didn't really affect me that much. Okay, if you don't want to date, then uh, so be it. And I'm glad that uh, I didn't get into perseveration station like so many of us who will pursue someone that we're, who we're interested in. And in these days, it can become an issue of stalking. So that's something that we need to be careful with. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And just going off what Stephen was saying about the whole stalking element, that's that's really why, and, and, and I provide mentoring to individuals with special needs transitioning to adulthood. And I would say about 90, 95% of the time, they don't want to talk about mock interviews. They don't want to talk about post-secondary opportunities. They want to talk about the cute boy and the cute girl that they're meeting mm -hmm. and how they go about asking them out, going on a date, getting yeah. into a relationship. And again, those different levels of intimacy. So I, I mean, I didn't have my first girlfriend until I was 18, but once I started to answer your question about starting to feel those feelings, uh, it was very much like the similar, like, oh, girls have cooties. And then once I got into um, my teenage years, I was like, oh, wait, girls do not have cooties. Girls are actually potentially somebody I might want to be with at some point. So uh, there was a big transitional uh, stage for me. Uh, most of my friends also didn't have girlfriends. So it, was, it wasn't like I could go about and just be like, so how did you get that girl's number? So there was really, again, no blueprint to that whole transitional time of puberty. And uh, I, I'm so glad Stephen mentioned the whole stalking element, because I, I think we definitely need to talk to our loved ones about rejection, especially mm -hmm. at the beginning, because we see all these movies that talk about the hopeless romantics who like run to the train station, who, who write a hundred letters and then they end up getting the girl at the end. Yeah. And I, I think we need to explain expectations versus reality uh, and, and really make sure that our loved ones are understanding rejection, are understanding intimacy, and then role playing situations mm -hmm. with them so they can actually go about getting that partner. So, do you remember um, your first kiss, the both of you? Not with each other, <laughs> with the person <laughs> you were dating. <laughs> Stephen, I remember our first kiss physically. Uh, oh yes, yeah, it, it was uh, Midtown Manhattan. We were getting sushi. No, uh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I love you, Stephen. Uh, love my, you my first, too, my, my first kiss. I I was uh, the the girl who ended up being my girlfriend. I was eighteen at the time. Uh, she was giving me signals and I did not know that she was uh, nonverbal communication and body language was very, very like, oh, this girl is tapping me on the shoulder. She, and it's kind of lingering. Oh my God, what is going on? I've never mm -hmm. had this experience before. Uh, I remember my first kiss. It was just one of those, like, I didn't expect it. She just r ran up basically and, and, and kissed me uh, while we were watching a, a, a movie. And I just felt to myself just, just so much passion at, at, at that moment, but also at the same time, just being like, oh my God, I, I didn't expect that. And right. by that age, most of my sensory challenges went away. Okay. And the only the only sensory challenge I ever had was uh, unexpected and uh, unexpected sensory. So that was very unexpected. So I felt very overwhelmed at the time, but I was so glad that she made the made the move, so to speak. <laughs> Wow. Okay. And Stephen, what about you? Tell us about your first kiss. Uh, well, the first kiss was, uh, this was undergraduate school. Yep. And uh, I was spending a lot of time with this lady. And uh, we'd go to each other's houses and uh, have meals together. And then uh, one day when she saw me, she gave me a big hug and a kiss. Like kiss on the cheek, like just a no, friend. No, no, right, 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 right on the, right on the mouth. Okay. And uh, 
I thought, okay, that's nice. I didn't really understand what, what it was. Yeah. And looking back, uh, I think uh, she was using nonverbal communication as Carrie uh, described. Yeah. Uh, but I wasn't picking up on the cues. And since I didn't pick up on the cues, uh, I guess uh, the whole thing just went away. Um, however, uh, sometime later on, uh, if uh, we want to talk about uh, dating, uh, and I'm not sure if it counts as dating this experience, but at least it was some kind of exposure to it. Yeah. What I mean by that is that uh, I was spending a lot of time with this lady. Uh, like before, we'd have meals together, we'd go out to concerts, movies, uh, ride bicycles, and she even, uh, she even invited me to sleep at her house one day. And that's exactly what I did. So um, when you, so when you, so when a person with autism hears, oh, do you want to come over in like in a, in a neurotypical world, that would be, you want to come over, you know, and that, mm -hmm. you know, it has a, its own sort of connotation to that invitation. So, so did you interpret that as literally come over and and just sleep there on my, like sleep on my bed, like a mummy? Like, did you just think, did you, like, did you, did you understand the context or no? No, I didn't understand the context. So uh, that's exactly what we did. We slept and then got up in the morning and it was time to go back to school. Uh, the same person also told me that she really likes hugs in back rooms. And what I thought was, well, gee, um, as one who is a deep pressure seeker, I've got this brand new friend who doubles as a source of deep pressure, just like a Temple Grandin squeeze machine. <laughs> but I guess she had some other ideas. And after a lot of conversation, I realized she wanted to be my girlfriend. Uh, however, I wasn't, still then, I wasn't really interested in dating. And, uh, but what this experience did tell me is that there was this whole area of communication that we call nonverbal. Right. And that idea of nonverbal communication became another passion or highly focused interest. And I would spend hours reading books on body language, on relationships, dating for dummies, and so on, building a lexicon of nonverbal communication. Wow. So did you divulge to your then girlfriends, um, you know, Carrie and Stephen, that you had autism? Is this something that you kind of, were you honest about it, like right at the beginning, so that you know, you, you know, you weren't, you weren't, you just wanted to start off on the right foot and not keep any secrets or did you, did you keep that to yourself for a while? Well, since that person was not a girlfriend, uh, it didn't occur to me to talk about it. Uh, then later on, I did have a girlfriend in undergraduate school. And uh, oh, this is a different girl. Yeah, this was a different one. Yeah. Oh, what? Okay. Wow. Steven, I can't keep up. I can't keep up with your love life. <laughs> Yeah, I can't do that. So, there's so much going on. <laughs> so in this case, um, uh, she, uh, uh, and she is the one that I had, I would say my first official kiss with, uh, someone who was a girlfriend. And it was something that she suddenly did. It seemed kind of weird to do it, but it was kind of like, okay. Uh, we can we can do this. And, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. And uh, so she she had taught me a number of things, including uh, intimate relationships and okay. what do, sexually, because like Carrie, there was no blueprint. Um, I had read some things in books, but it's one thing to have book knowledge; it's one it's another thing to have practical knowledge. And I remember not talking to her about being autistic because uh, at that time uh, being autistic wasn't really important to me. Mm, yeah. In fact, if somebody had asked me, uh, were you autistic when you were a kid or if the subject came up, I never did. I probably would have said, well, yeah, I was autistic when I was a kid, but I'm over that now because I'm in college and 
to doing all of these things. Yeah. However, one day when we were at my parents' house, uh, my mother did uh, take it upon her to herself uh, to disclose uh, what I thought at that time my past with autism was. Right. And uh, so uh, she found it very interesting and uh, she seemed to understand, uh, which was good. Uh, some people asked me, do you mind that your mother disclosed for you? And a lot of people I think probably would mind, but it, it didn't bother me at all because it was something that existed. It didn't occur to me to talk about it. Yeah. So um, you know, that was perfectly fine. Carrie, what about you? When you, you know, your girlfriend, when you were 18, like, did you feel like yeah. it was important to, to share it? Because obviously, you know, if you have autism, there are, you know, aspects of your condition that might affect the way that you might forge a relationship. I mean, right. let's, let's take your, your sensory, um, you know, your, your sensory challenges, for example, or is this something that you just kind of, you know, like kept to yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my first girlfriend, so we went to a school for kids with learning disabilities. So all the kids knew they had some form of disability. My girlfriend had ADD and ADHD. I had autism and we were all pretty open about it simply yeah. because we all knew we had some form yeah. of learning disability. So it really didn't come up until my second girlfriend, uh, maybe a year and a half later, where she she had no idea that I was on the spectrum. And I remember posting, I, I think it was on MySpace. So before Facebook and posting something autism awareness related, because uh, during college was the first time I actually ever told anyone that was on the autism spectrum. Yeah, I have this quote unquote invisible disability where so many people come up to me in my life and they say, Carrie, you have autism, but you don't look like you have autism. Uh, and I'm like, what's autism supposed to look like anyway? So anyways, long story short, I've had a very mixed bag. So I I, I ended up not, met, I, I mentioned it to my second girlfriend simply because she asked why I was pas passionate about autism, posting it on MySpace. Yeah. And, and now today when I date, I usually don't bring it up. Uh, simply because the, most of the people I know who bring it up really bring it up because they know, for example, that they might be, they, they might say something that's very authentic, that's very true, but it might not be the best thing to say to a girlfriend or somebody who has communication difficulties, who has sensory challenges like I, I had extremely when I was a kid. So it's very case by case. Unfortunately, most girls today, and then not, not unfortunately, but most girls today know I have autism right off the bat because we live in a digital age. And right. every single time I go on a date, people go on Google, they type in Carrie Magro, and then the first thing that comes up in books and my public speaking right. so it's it's kind of more they've already done their research beforehand <laughs> so do you find that um you know dating now you know with with um the girls that you meet obviously they've as you said they've done their homework they've researched they they know that you're you know both of you are public figures do you feel like um that um affects your date like are they more interested or are they more guarded or are they just intrigued um like how does that really how does that play out on your date oh it's it's very much a mixed bag i've had i've had a girl uh who i went on a few dates with who said i i don't think this is going to work out because I'm, I'm not sure i want to date a celebrity and i was like oh all right that's that that's interesting that's something new uh and then other times i've i I've had people on dates literally within the first few dates ask like 20 autism related questions before, before like I even mentioned that I'm on the spectrum. And then I'm thinking to myself, it's like, gee, it's like, she doesn't want to know where I'm from. If I have any siblings, what I do for a career, but she'll, she'll talk about Temple Grandin. She'll talk about Steven. Actually, Steven came up on one date, which was interesting, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which we could talk a little bit about. Uh, but no, it's like, it's, it, it, it's all of that. And especially I understand the whole concept of not wanting to be catfished because yeah. catfishing in our society mm -hmm. is so prevalent. Yeah. Um, 
but it's it, it's also sometimes a detriment uh, to uh, dating because it, it, it I can't provide my true self because there's already something that's online that kind of right. gives uh, understanding of who I am. Right. So, I mean, so Stephen, you're married. You have a really loving, healthy, successful marriage for many, many years. Um, and you, you know, you're on the spectrum and you have a lot of very um, distinct needs, even now as an adult. So what do you think, um, what, are, what are the factors that you feel have contributed to your marriage lasting this long? You know, being, you know, having, you know, a neurotypical wife and then, you know, married to somebody with autism. How, how, have, you, how have the both of you made it work for all this time? Well, I think uh, communication and the fact that we realize that we need to we need to communicate and talk about things more than perhaps a typical couple would. Yeah. And my wife comes from the People's Republic of China. Uh, she had been in the United States for about 18 months when we initially met. And uh, so given that there's two cultures, different cultures, uh, we automatically understand we may need to talk through a few things even more. And yeah. then when it comes to uh, being autistic, that adds another layer of needing to be sure about communication. And uh, we've made some adjustments. So for example, when people talk to each other about emotional or weighty things, commonly they face each other when they yeah. do so and make a lot of eye contact. But eye contact can be difficult. Uh, then again, who says that you have to look at each other when you talk? And maybe we could sit side by side, or maybe we could talk in the dark. And I haven't done this, but I know of some autistic couples who will talk via instant message. Now they may even be in the same room or they may be in adjoining rooms. And if that helps them communicate, uh, then that's, uh, that works out very well. Yeah. Uh, my wife is uh, aware of my sensory issues and she makes accommodations and navigates around them, uh, which is very, very helpful. And also at the same time, I need to realize that my wife is not autistic. Mm -hmm. As a result, she'll have different needs and different understandings about society. So sometimes she'll tell me about a social situation and perhaps how I should behave or how she behaved and this is why, or she makes an observation about somebody. And I just wonder how in the world does she know this? But since we've been married for over 30 years, uh, I've gotten to trust that she just happens to know these things. And if she says something, she's probably right. And I should just follow it. Right. Wow. So, you know, having a supportive partner that um, understands all of and accepts all of you, I think that is, you know, what makes your marriage work. I think that's amazing. And, and Carrie, what about you? I mean, you obviously you've spoken about um, being in, in relationships in the past. Um, have like, what's the, what's the longest relationship that you've been in? Oh, wow. Longest relationship I've been in was two and a half years. So okay. uh, I, I, I've, I basically thought that I was going to, I, I've had marriage conversations with uh, several of my past relationships. Uh, so I, two and a half years, two years, and then uh, one that was uh, about 18, 18, 16, 18 months. So why do you think, um, the, what do you think didn't work in those uh, I, I, I think it's nothing that is in relationship to my specific autism diagnosis. Yeah. I think we all drifted apart. Uh, in most of my relationships, it was simply just having different uh, long-term interests. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have always kind of seen myself as somebody who wants to raise a family one day. Uh, but there are other individuals who are not necessarily like that or ready for that. So uh, that's for the most part why most of them, I, I have been on both 
the receiving end of a breakup and also the, the uh, breakup person. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I've seen both of those experiences and, um, you know, I'm, I'm still searching for the one uh, love on the spectrum and all those other pop culture yeah. things give me a lot of hope for the future, seeing yeah. other individuals in our community having some success. Uh, so fingers crossed for the future. Um, so, you know, all of the nuances that go into nurturing, nurturing a relationship, especially if you two are going to be dating neurotypical women, you know, there are things that there are things that girls like, you know, girls like when you notice that they have a new, you know, that, that they're wearing a new um, lipstick, that they have a new outfit on, that they got their hair done. Um, that it's, you know, your anniversary and you're supposed to get something special on that day. Um, so are these things, are the, do you, do you know these things? Like, are you aware of these things or have you at some point just completely missed the boat and didn't notice or just forgot? Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, do you, do you, um, do you know about these little nuances that kind of, um, that contribute to, you know, the girl being happy in the relationship. Um, Cause you know, girls look for this kind of stuff. Well, I have read about these things and yeah. I do put them into practice whenever I can. So for example, if I'm traveling and I call my wife, um, she, uh, she'll ask me how things are going. And then I have to make sure to ask her how her day was. Right. Instead of just uh, monologuing about my day. I also need to notice uh, any differences, uh, such as a new dress, or if she asks me, uh, do I look fat? So what and do you I, say? I think, what do you say? One, there is only one answer to that question. <laughs> well, only one answer. And, uh, and I found it interesting to, to see what people notice. And right. I actually did an experiment on my wife one time, which uh, I find quite humorous. And that was, we were at a, we were at a clothing store. It was, her birthday was just right around the corner. So I was being a little bit sneaky. And my intention was, uh, don't let her buy it. Now I know what she wants. And not only that, I'll have the perfect size. Right. So she tried it on. So one day while she was at work, I went out and I bought that very dress and took it up and hung it, uh, hung it in a doorway. Because uh, I was just curious to see how long would it take my wife to notice. Yeah. And I think it took her about three or four days. Really? But once she did notice it hanging there, uh, she was extremely grateful uh, for it. Oh. And she also asked me if, uh, she asked me um, if I felt bad that she didn't notice. And I said, no, I don't feel bad at all. I was just kind of curious to see how long it would take and Eventually, I would have told you, or you would have bumped into it and knocked it down, and you would have seen it. So it was no big deal to me that she didn't notice. Yeah. And Carrie, what about you? Oh my goodness! Uh, how much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I I've learned over the years one of the most important things that any any person in a relationship can do, or their significant loved one, is to listen. Uh, to listen and to be present. Uh, and that for me has been something that has really benefited me in most of the relationships that I've been in, simply being the person who is not only the confidant, but also the ear for somebody to just talk and for me to be able to take in everything and kind of just have ask questions also another big big key uh, <laughs> uh, so those are definitely the two things that i've learned the most uh especially when it comes to dating and i i i think in terms of the the whole like oh if somebody's wearing a new dress i i've always been I've always been a person who gives compliments, but I, I don't try to give compliments to the point of it, it feeling like overdone. Like, yeah. I, like I, every little thing doesn't necessarily have to be acknowledged as a compliment. Um, it, it, if you can give, I, I, I usually, my, my, my trade of thought is if you could give somebody just a few compliments a day just to 
kind of promote kindness, not even if it's a relationship partner, but just anyone, I think it definitely goes a long, long way though. And uh, I, 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 with every relationship I've been in though, I've always been the person to notice if somebody had a haircut and it, it looked really great and to, to be the one to acknowledge that. So did you, did that come naturally to you? Like, or did you, did you learn that incidentally? or were you taught? Because this is the thing about dating. This is the thing about being in a relationship with anyone, like whether you have autism or not. Um, as you said, Stephen, there isn't a rule book. You just, you don't, there, you, you kind of just learn by experience. You get burned sometimes. You get, um, you know, you get hurt, you cry. You, this is, this is kind of, this is how you learn. So I'm just wondering, like, how did you and like, how did the both of you learn um, these little nuances of, you know, how to behave in a relationship? Um, I know, Stephen, you read about it, but Carrie, did you research and read about it too? Or did you just kind of, you know, learn through experience and just whatever happened in that experience, you took kind of the, the information from that? Honestly, a lot of it was pop culture as a kid, seeing sitcoms where a uh, the wife would punch the guy in the shoulder because she, she he he didn't recognize her. All, all of those things, even though I took everything with a grain of salt, because I, again, expectation versus yeah. reality. Uh, that was kind of how I learned in many instances. To uh, role playing was always key for my life, whether it was doing social story therapy, to trying to put myself in this situation before I was in this situation. And mm -hmm. I think that's why I really latched on to movies and television because I would love romantic comedies. I would always picture myself one day having a family. So I would take those little things and I would kind of tie them into just how to be a good partner and to be the best version of myself for a significant partner. So it was a lot of just the entertainment world, honestly. And then also asking questions of my family members as well. Being an only child, uh, I was very, very close to my immediate family uh, and would always be willing to ask them questions about this topic because I'm, I'm very much, I was very much like my mentees. I, I would never want to talk about mock interviews. I would never want to talk about going to college. I would want to talk about, oh, she's pretty. How do I get her number and go on a date with her? Right. So yeah, I was, I was the same one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, gosh, guys, thank you for um, sharing those stories. It's just, it's so interesting kind of getting into your head and, um, and just hearing about your experiences with dating and love. Um, and um, actually, before I close this subject, Carrie, I have to ask you, and I know I'm not going to ask you, Stephen, because I know that you have no, you have no business being on any kind of dating app. So <laughs> I hope not anyway. Uh, so Carrie, um, first of all, which dating app? I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, so I'm on, yeah, and Stephen, no, you're not allowed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Coffee Meets Bagel. Uh, Coffee Meets Bagel, uh, Hinge, and- uh, Bagel? Yeah, it's coffee meets bagel. So you get twenty, you, you get like twenty four new people a day, and you kind of have to decide which ones you like. You can pass on them, or you can give the little heart, and then they potentially match up with you, and then you have a conversation. So that one hinge is a really popular one, and then there's also a dating app that I haven't tried yet, but it's spraying around the country, uh, Hickey. Uh, H-I-K-I, which is one of the first dating apps for individuals with autism who want to go about getting into relationships with wow. other individuals with autism. So it's a very up and coming app, but uh, if uh, I, it might be something I try in the future. So are you, um, so I know, you know, Stephen is married to someone who does not have autism. Do you, like, are you, I mean, do you mind? Are you, are you kind of, are you leaning more towards, you know, someone with autism because they can, you know, they have, they can, they have a commonality or are you leaning to more towards, you know, a neurotypical girlfriend? 
I have never dated somebody who's on the spectrum. All okay. of my uh, dating partners have been neurotypical, but I am totally open to anyone uh, really just finding that connection, finding someone who I have similar interests to and that attraction to is really, really key for me. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. I want to ask you both, um, I kind of want to close on like a on, a, on a nice, positive, wholesome note. What do you think, um, how do you think we are all more um, alike than we are different in terms of, um, you know, forging on, forging relationships? Um, say, so say someone who is neurotypical um, is curious about um, a person with autism or wants to be, you know, wants to be friends with them. Um, they don't know, they don't know how to go about it. Um, how, how do you, how can you explain um, how we are more alike than different? Yeah, I, I'll start this one off. And I think the most important word is connection. Autistic people do want to be connected with others. Autistic mm -hmm. people do want to socialize. It's a myth that autistic people don't want to socially interact. I think what happens is that in the grade school days, we have so many experiences where attempted social interaction goes badly. Mm -hmm. We don't get something right, we end up getting bullied. And eventually we say, this social interaction thing goes wrong most of the time, it's just bad. So I think I'm just going to give up. Right. However, for most uh, autistic people I talk to, they do desire a connection with another person. And we desire a deep connection with another person. So that is one area that we are alike with uh, humanity. And I believe that rather than thinking of autism as this kind of strange difference, it's better to think of autism as an extension the diversity of the human gene pool. Yes. Well said. Well said, Stephen. I, I I would just add that it's it's really not about autism is a very, very wide spectrum. And I, I feel like the more people understand that autism is a spectrum, the better it will be to break down barriers, misconceptions within our autism community as well, especially for those who don't have a personal connection, because those are the people that often kind of have the whole Rain Man stereotype where they yeah. think that all people with autism are boys, that they're all bad with communication, they're all good at math. Uh, I'm not very good in many of those things. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> communication, I guess, today a little bit more than I, I used to. But I think if I could leave any, anyone watching this with just some final thoughts is just treat people with autism like people. Treat them like human beings. Go up and say hi. Don't feel like because you might know that somebody's on the autism spectrum that that makes them incapable of connection, incapable of making friends and relationships, and just treat them with the own, their own uniqueness, just like any one of us who have our own strengths and challenges in this world. And hopefully it will lead to something special. That was just so beautiful and insightful. And um, just thank you for your time, guys. Oh, my pleasure. Great spending time with you, Carrie. Yes. yes. Thank Absolutely. You so it, it's been a while, Stephen, since we saw each other. And it was thank you so much for having us on. Oh, Carrie, before we go, could you you said that you um you have a book specifically about relationships, yeah? Yes. Uh so that book is Autism and Falling in Love. It's available on Amazon, uh, and it's about becoming the best quality version of yourself, uh, regardless if you're on the spectrum or not. So it's very also giving tips to neurotypical individuals on how they can become the best version of themselves for their partners based on my personal experiences trying to find love. Well, there you go. That's another one on my list too then. Um, and of course, all of, Stephen, all of Stephen's books. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. You Thanks, too. You too. Bye.